Hi everyone, this is Carlos Bossi, and um, uh, we're going to get going here. Sorry, we're a couple of minutes late trying to find the right links uh, for what we're doing. Uh, hopefully, everybody can see my uh, slide deck, uh, and uh, and you're you're actually seeing the past performance virtual group April 2019 on your screen. Uh, John, I hope we have you there. Let me just make sure we've got John. Uh, John, if you're there, I can't hear you. So uh, you're either on mute or let's see. Just a second. We'll wait for John to come in. Maybe I, uh, let me see if I, uh, Need to unmute him. Okay, John, maybe we could we should be able to hear you now. Why don't you go ahead? Hey, can you hear me now? Awesome. Hey, technology, you know, that's the hard part here. I can hear you. Awesome, great. Loud and clear. Hey, John, so since we're running a little behind, I'm going to go through the introduction here in a couple minutes, okay. and then we can just uh, let you uh, let you take it over and go from there, okay? Sounds great. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining the Past Performance Virtual Group. Uh, I'm Carlos Bossi. I'm going to be the moderator today, and as you can tell, I'm not usually the moderator, so I, I always have to learn how to do this uh, each time we do it. Um, but the Past Performance Virtual Group is, uh, uh, you can reach us at our website and Twitter and, and email and that sort of thing. So there's some info about us. Um, we always have technical questions and there's always a few that come up. Uh, one question is about, uh, uh, is this being recorded? And it is being recorded. We always try to record it, post it on our YouTube channel. It doesn't happen right away after the session, but it happens. Uh, so uh, you'll see it up on our YouTube channel. And also, uh, we can't really solve your computer problems. So sometimes you'll have some and you can't hear us or that sort of thing. And it's hard to hard to uh, resolve those issues. But uh, hopefully uh, you can hear us well and everything will go well today. I um, want to talk about PASS a little bit, the Professional Association for SQL Server. It tur it's turning 20 uh, tomorrow, actually. Uh, so there's some contests and celebrations. So if you follow Pass on Twitter, you should see that. Um, there's also 24 hours of Pass coming up. The 20 years. Oh, geez, that's actually going on like right now, I think. Uh, so uh, there's also uh, 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 that event going on. A lot of stuff happening with Pass right now. Also, they uh, announced the pre-conference speakers for Pass 2019, which is in early November. So if you're interested in seeing who's speaking. Uh, uh, for pre-cons, go out to the uh, website and take a look. And then there's also the blogger program, and they're looking for active bloggers. Uh, again, another thing to become part of. There's a lot of stuff you can do as part of PASS, so you can become part of that as well. And uh, the PASS Summit, this is an important one. Um, PASS Summit's the best conference for SQL Server in the world. It's, uh, it's uh, an interna international conference that brings together everybody around the world. It usually happens in Seattle. It'll be in Seattle this year in November. Please uh, make it a point to go. You can get $150 off right now if you use the code that's in front of you, which is VGDIS6I5Q, I believe. Uh, type that code in when you sign up, and it'll give you $150 off. And uh, I'd love to see you at the PASS Summit. I've been there probably for 10 straight years, and it's a great conference. There's other uh, virtual groups going on. Obviously, ours is going on today. There was uh, there's some coming up in the future. There's always something going on at PASS. Uh, DBA Fundamentals uh, next week, as, as well as there's an Italian chapter, a virtual cha virtualization chapter, Data Architecture Cloud, and so on. So there's a lot of stuff going on. So uh, it's all free. So be part of uh, the PASS community and join those virtual groups as well. There's also... Uh, Oh, here's all the virtual groups, all the logos at least, uh, so you can see how many we have. And then we also have SQL Saturdays, and uh, uh, Madison's having one this Saturday, Madison, Wisconsin, and Colorado Springs as well. And I'm going to be speaking at the one in Colorado Springs uh, this Saturday, but they're all over the world. 
Orange County, Raleigh, Edmonton, Redmond, and Phoenix, and so on, and uh, Croatian also on Saturday, Israel next week, and Budapest the following week, uh, and Brazil uh, this Saturday as well. Uh, so there's just a ton of stuff going on. Also, uh, great speakers at those uh, SQL Saturdays. And just be part of PASS, it's free. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of education you get from it. So you can see in a lot of, a lot of ways you can volunteer. I'm gonna introduce John Sterrett today. He's gonna talk about automating the pain away with SQL Server 2019. I know, I've know i known John for a long time. He's one of the true experts in the SQL Server world. So we're glad to have him. I'm gonna hand over uh, uh, the presentation to you, John. And, um, and then, uh, okay. I'd love to see, uh, and, and I'm looking really looking forward to uh, what you're going to show us because it's always really good. So let me make sure I do that properly. Oh, the, I don't think so. Um, so anyway, you can just grant me admin, and then I can run through and do it all. Yeah, before. that's what I was trying to do. So I should be doing it right now, and you can uh, you should have that capability right now. There we go. Thank okay. you, sir. All right, so let's get this. Whoa, what just happened there? All right, and are you able to see my screen? Uh, it's coming up right now as we speak. Just uh, I don't see it yet. It's almost there. I see. Uh, let's see. Hold on just a second. I don't see it yet. Let me make sure it's not just me. All right, let me make myself presenter here. Okay. Oh, you need to end your sharing. I need to end it, okay. I thought I had actually. Let me do that again. Should be ended. Why am I not seeing the option already? Um, let me try that again, because sometimes it takes a couple of times before it works. Oh, that's the wrong person. That's why, I'm sorry. I'm so used it's always running the high availability virtual chapter one that I, I got thought you. it was you. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. All so right. Process of elimination. You should now be able to get my screen here. I see your screen right. now, and I hope everybody else does. I think we're ready to roll. All right. And you can, and you can hear me just fine? I can hear you really well. Perfect. All right, everyone, so we're gonna go ahead and get started here. My name is John Sterrett, and we don't have much time, so as Carlos mentioned, I've been doing SQL Server stuff forever, that's all you're gonna hear me say about me. The next thing, especially because we are very short on time here, I want everyone to know that we have links available and some videos already out there, so even before Carlos gets them out to you on the web page, you can go ahead and get access to some of those already. All right. Oh, we skipped a slide. We're skipping multiple slides. Uh, all right. Here's our agenda that we're going to try to get through as much of this as we can here today. We're going to focus on how SQL Server helps you run faster without changing any of your code here with 2017 and 2019. So we're gonna start off with some basics on query store here, going over what's known as automatic tuning for you. So this would be locking in good execution plans. And then we're gonna go over something that's really, really cool I think a lot of people aren't using yet with query store, which is being able to get weight statistics information for execution plans for time intervals. So if anyone's used a great vendor tool that's been around forever um, called Confio, which got bought by SolarWinds and renamed as DPA, if you get the latest version of Management Studio, which would be 2018 RC, 
you'll see there's actually a report built in there for weight stats that kind of gives you a smaller version of that. That's pretty cool. So there's a lot of slicing and dicing you can do to figure out what's your top weight resource for a period of time and then find exactly which queries are driving that pain. Next, we're going to go into this new area that was rebranded, renamed to collect a few things called IQP. And basically in IQP, we're going to go over scalar functions and how scalar functions now no longer suck. You actually get set based logic instead of row by row based logic, which we'll go over. And then we'll also go over some of the adaptive joins, interleave execution, memory grant stuff as well, hopefully. All right. So with that, first we're going to talk a little bit about the life of an execution plan. And the main reason why is because this is a core fundamental that everyone needs to know. And sometimes this is so basic, a lot of people even forget this. So you execute a T-SQL statement. Does the plan exist in CAP? If it does, it's going to go ahead and reuse it. If not, it's going to build that execution plan with the parameters at runtime, put that in memory, and then use the plan for you. So most of the time, this is really, really good. But there's also times where it can be very, very hurtful. And some of these features that we're going to go over go over making your code run faster by making better choices here. In fact, even in some cases, we'll be pausing, get better statistics, and then go ahead and run through, which we'll go ahead and show you in some of our demos here. All right, so real basic query store, since we're kind of short on time, this is basically just showing you one of the bread and butter use cases. You have two different plans, one good, one's bad. You can easily detect this. And Due to time here, we're going to go and skip. Here's just a real world example that will be in the slide deck that shows exactly how, in the real world, with one of my clients, how automated plan changes have been very helpful. Here's just showing you how you can preview them. And then now we're actually going to jump into a demo here. All right. So, we are going to go into our demos. Are any questions, Carlos? Uh, real quick, while I'm getting this up here. Uh, not yet, John. Oh, Carlos, no. are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Right. No. Not. No question. Go ahead and start. Okay. All right, so we're going to start looking here at query store weights. And this will give us a good little dive and understanding of query store. So when you are using query store out of the box, meaning not pass uh, platform as a service here, you actually have to enable it, which we're going to do here. And for this demo, we're using parameters that allow me to collect as much as I can really quick. You would not want this for production. This is here just so we get some good data that we can look at. All right, next thing we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and throw everything for query store away. So I want to start off brand new fresh so we have nothing in query store. In fact, if I run this query fast enough here, well, we should not see that much in there. Um, this is stuff that's been running behind the scenes just since we cleared it off here. All right, so I'm going to do a couple of things. Since I dropped my clean buffers, this means I took all of my data pages out of memory. I'm going to do a select star from a real big table. And the whole goal here is just so that we will be able to see some disk I.O. when we actually look at our weight statistics. So this will take a few seconds. All right, completed. So now I'm going to look at a particular customer that we're going to use for a very classic example of blocking. So I'm going to go ahead and do select star here to show you that we're just going to be working with actually 102 records. Due to the time, I'm just going to even go ahead and skip that. 
I'm going to begin an explicit transaction here. That's going to be left open. And my whole goal here is I have an update occurring. Now, in another session, I'm going to try to select data here. And we can see we are actually blocked here. I could let this go on and on and on and on forever. And this isn't going to stop. This isn't ever going to run. I mean, until we either commit or roll back here. So I am going to go ahead and roll this guy back now. And then the next thing I'm going to do with query stores, I'm just going to run a stored procedure that's going to take the in-memory portion of query store and persist it out to disk for me. And that's just so we have it there. All right, so now we have our block. We have one case where we have um, some disk latency. Now we're going to start to actually look at our weights here. So in SQL Server 2017, this didn't get a whole lot of advertising, but there was a new DMV called Query Stat Weight Statistics that actually allows us to dive into our weight statistics on an execution plan level. So the very first thing we're going to do here is we're going to look at queries in here that were executed that use that sale invoice table. Now, one thing you're going to note here is our update statement is not in here, and that's because we rolled it back and it wasn't caught. So that's something that you definitely want to keep in mind, that even though we've told them to go through and collect everything, there are some cases where you won't be able to get exactly everything. All right, so we ran our query here. And I know here that we really want to focus on the query that had to wait that was blocked, which is going to be our guy here, number query number seven. So I'm going to copy this, and we're going to go over here. And we're going to go ahead and look at our execution plans. And the reason why here is it's always possible, one, our plan ID will not be the same as our query, and we can actually have multiple plan IDs associated to a query ID. So to keep things simple, we have one here. We're gonna go back over to our editor, and it actually, in our case, here is the same number. So now we're gonna go ahead and look at that weight statistics DMV here that's gonna have some information for us. So as I go ahead and run this, well, see, there's two queries that we're looking at. So the first one gives us our time intervals. This is our time slices. So I set this up for query store to give us a new time slice every single minute so I can get as much data as possible while we're showing here. This is showing our exact query that we wanted to focus on. And you can see that it was blocked. And we can see how long that blocking occurred. So some other things to note here is you have a segregate key over here for the wait stats ID that have this data at the plan ID level, so you can have multiple plans for a query. We also have our runtime interval. So you can really slice and dice this data down. And then, of course, we have your category types here and then your aggregate meet data that you would want to look at. So the last part here, we're just going to go ahead and get right after aggregating all of the data here. Ideally, you would probably want to have a filter in here to get your intervals for time. And then the last thing here, we're just going to do a dump and say, show us everything that's in our query stats. So there we can see our lock. And then here's other queries that ran and resources that they were weighted on. So I bet a lot of people see this and they think, we could do some amazing stuff with this. Well, as I had dinner with a friend of mine, he made it known to my attention that the newest release candidate of SQL Server Management Studio actually has something even much better than this. And if we actually go over to 
query store here, you'll see this report over here called Query Weight Statistics. So I'm going to go ahead and load this, and I'm going to get this going here. Oh, picked the wrong database. I'm sorry. Let me make sure I'm in the one that we were using for a demo here. which would be Wild World Importers, not Wild World Importers Data Warehouse. All right, and we want to go to Query Store and Weight Statistics. There we go. All right, so as this is loading, you can already see that we have resources here that we could see obviously in this example our locking is our biggest offender here we had a little bit of buffer io because we forced all the pages out that a scan across our top table so the nice thing to note here is if we actually went to configure that we can slice and dice this by almost any time interval we would want the thing that you have to realize and know though is the, the intervals of captures which we showed you in the previous query is really how the data is collected. And this is just a way to kind of filter around those through the report. All right, so if we go look at locked, we're obviously gonna see our big query that was blocked as we expected. The other nice thing here, if I go over to network IO, so now I'm gonna see multiple queries and I'm gonna see some more things that participated and might not have been super helpful for us. So the whole point here that I want to make sure everyone knows is Query Store can really be your best friend. I work with a lot of different companies out in the field, and whenever I work with newer customers, I tend to find that most of them aren't using Query Store because you either don't know why it's to enable it, or even that it's not enabled and you have to enable it. So I submitted a session to pass going over six different problems solved with Query Store. And Carlos, if you want, I, I'm sure we'll be able to do it here as well later on in the year. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up that demo. And we're gonna keep moving along here. So the next thing we're gonna go look at is automatic tuning here. So let me go ahead and pull up our example of automatic tuning here. So I'm gonna go here, recent files, full demo. All right, so we are gonna go over a feature that came with SQL Server 2017 called automatic tuning for slash good plan. And we're gonna walk through this here. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and set our compatibility mode to 2019. Sorry, it looks like my VM here is a little sluggish right now. But all right, we're gonna go ahead and get this set up using the new 2019 and we're on CTP 2.4, which just recently came out. And I wanna make sure automatic tuning is off. Now, one thing you might have asked or wondered is why are we setting up Query Store? Well, automatic tuning is a feature that's based off of Query Store. It's going to take the data that's been collected and use good logic there to go ahead and do wonderful things, starting out with being able to force good plans, which we're gonna go over. So in one of our first slides, we talked a little bit about how execution plans work. And the reason why is because we're gonna show you how what's known as data skew here is going to actually change the way execution plans get built. And remember, once a plan is built, it tries to stay in memory as long as it can and be reused. And most of the time that's great, but we're gonna focus on some scenarios where it isn't and some of these new features end up being helpful. So two territory IDs we're gonna focus on today is territorial ID 20. And the reason why is because we have a very small amount of data there, which would be 100. And then of course, we're gonna look at the very big one here that has over 273,000. 
right. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure we have no execution plans in cache. And we're going to go ahead and execute these here one by one. So I'm going to go here. Oh, let me make sure I turn on my execution plan here. So what we're going to see here, this is our small case with only the 100 rows. Now, because we have 100 rows here, a nested loop is a good operator. Because think of this as a for each loop. Everything that's happening up here, we're going to do what's underneath it. So doing this 100 times, not that big of a bad deal. Now, if we try to do this with a lot more data, that's going to be a different story. So we're going to go ahead and remove our plans that are in cache here inside of our database. And now we're going to go ahead and run our opposite scenario. So what kind of plan would we want if we were going to run for our big scenario here? So if I go look at our execution plan, we're going to see this is quite a bit different. So the first thing to note, one, we're going parallel. So we're also doing more stuff here. And we are scanning over here. And we've reached a tipping point in this example where the actual number of rows here is high enough where the optimizer thinks it might be better for you to actually scan instead of seek across all of them. So that's a key thing to point out. The other thing I want to drive home here is once again, if you build an execution plan, it gets put in memory. If you have parameters here, you can have your list of parameters here, and you can see exactly what was the parameter that was used when the execution plan was built, and then also what parameter is being used. So that's going to be important for us, because in the example that we just did, we ran the exact same sort of procedure with two different execution plans. And in those, we saw the best ideal execution plan for each one of those executions. Now remember, in the real world, you're going to have one that's in memory. And that's the one that's going to be used unless you're using query store to guide or some of the other methods that you could use, like this was the legacy SQL server, maybe we'd use a plan guide. Legacy, maybe I should refer to that more as obsolete now. But anyways. We're going to go back over here, and we're going to see if we can see these in our query store now. So I want to go over here to top resource consuming queries. And the goal here, if this catches is right, ooh, I, let me make sure I'm in the right one. Oh, let me flip over. First, sorry, once again, let me get into the SQL Server AdventureWorks 2012. And the whole goal here is just to once again show you that Query Store is a great tool that can help you find multiple execution plans and help lock in the one that is best for you. So I'm going to go over here and we're going to go ahead and load our report here. And then hopefully now we are going to see our statement with two execution plans. That's good. This is exactly what I was wanting us to see. So here we have, we've executed twice. You can see we have two plans here, one that's using a lot less duration and one that's much higher. So if we wanted to, we could easily click on both and compare these side by side. Or, so starting with SQL Server 2016, the use query store, you could click on the button to lock in your plan, or you can use this sort of procedure that will do it for you. Now, what we're going to be talking about going forward now is the automatic process of SQL Server doing this for you. And this could be a very helpful thing for you in the 3 o'clock in the morning scenario where performance goes bad. Um, this is a great scenario where a plan popped out of memory, and we Enter this scenario here where we had the execution plan for small data that ran that first time, so those plans were in there. And then after that, you have 
a lot more data and you see things slowing down. Well, SQL Server can work towards automatically fixing and also reverting back if needed for you. So with that, we're going to go ahead and go back over to our demo script. And we're going to go ahead and dive in here. Oh, demo. Right, so that's where we are. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to run a procedure that I have here that basically just clears everything out. And then I'm going to go ahead and run that territorial ID equaling 9 30 times here. So we're going to go ahead and let this run. And so we'll see here, this is our example, just as we expected, of big data coming through. So we're doing our scan instead of the seek over there. All right, so we can look here and see we ran this 30 times and it took about 14 seconds. So we could say this took about half a second on average. So we're gonna simulate that scenario I just talked about of our plan coming out of cache and the very first execution is going to be for a different skew of data that's much different. Okay. So this is what we expect here. This, this is our nested loop. We only have 100 rows coming in here. Now, we're not even going to run this 30 times. We're going to run this 20 here. So, and what we see here is kind of our worst case scenario. We got that for loop, right? That nested loop here. And we're going 273,000 times through it to do stuff that's underneath it. So this obviously is not ideal here. And in fact, we saw this took a little more than a second per execution. So we basically doubled our time. Here. Now, if we scroll down, And this worked. Oop. Can we make sure? That should have shown the execution plans changing for us. Let's. Let's see if we had anything come up in the recommendations here. No. Oh, we did not enable. Let me make sure that we enable here. So sorry, I'll make sure the demo script this gets cleaned up better, but I actually want to turn this on here. And yes, you should normally never type in a demo. But here we go. And we're gonna roll through that here one more time. And if that doesn't work, then we'll move on. So once again, we're going to bake this in here. So once again, this should take about a half a second every time it runs. And then we're going to go ahead and reload our So we got our small case here. And then we're going to go ahead and bounce back over here. And hopefully we'll see this flip over. The whole goal of the demo here is to show you is that the execution plan while it's running will actually flip. Without you having to do anything, it should automate the whole functionality of having to run the store procedure, or click on the plan to lock in. So I'll tell you what, because we're real short on time, we're going to have to go ahead and jump out of this one here. And on the link that I gave you, I'll make sure that we have a demo walking through here that works for you there with the latest release there. All right, since we are running low on time, we go ahead, we already went through and did those demos. Next, we're going to look at IQP. 
So on Microsoft Docs, there's actually a photo that I think does by far the best job of breaking down what's in 17, what's in 19. Um, so you have to be in batch mode or row mode as you're going through and using your execution plan. So when we look here, you can see that we have what we've known in 2017 as adaptive QP, which we're going to go over some of those demos here with adaptive joins and interleave executions here. Due to time, we'll probably end up skipping our memory graph. Also, we're going to go into scalar user-defined functions here and show you exactly how that gets better for you. All right, so interleaved executions. So with 2017, this works really great for multi-statement table value functions. And if you've ever used a multi-statement table value function, you'll see that it estimates how many rows are actually there being used. So if it's SQL Server 2016, I believe it's 100, and it's going to use that regardless of how many rows are really there. What happens here with interleaved executions is it's actually going to pause there materialize subtrees after it gets good statistics, and then it's going to continue to run the rest of the plan. So our demo is going to show you exactly how that works. Once again, here's some more information on cases where it will not be used. And due to time, we're going to go ahead and go into our demo here. All right. All right, so interleave executions here. All right, we are going to go ahead and use our wild world importers here. And we're going to go ahead and create two functions. One is what's known as a multi statement table value function, and the other is an inline. So if you are, are, are not familiar with what the difference is, a multi-statement table value function allows you to do multiple things. So a lot of people think, because you can define exactly what you're returning here, that might make this a lot better. Um, but we're going to see here that actually, if you have a multi-statement table function that can be turned into an inline one, you actually would get better performance with inline here. So here we're doing multiple things. We're selecting data. We're inserting it into our table variable here, and then we're returning it. Where our inline function is called inline because we're just doing one single thing and we're returning it, which is why you don't see us defining what we're table we're having, or you don't see us returning it here as well or inserting into it. All right, so let me go ahead and create those. Come on, VM. All right, now we're going to go ahead and go over here, and we're going to go, go ahead and turn on our set statistics, and we are going to run these. So first, we're going to have our multi-statement table value function. So we're going to run two queries. They are exactly identical, same data. The only difference is changing between multi-statement and inline statement functions that we just created. So we're going to go ahead and run this guy here. And when we see our execution plan, we should notice a couple of things. One, as I mentioned here, no matter how much data is in your multi-statement function, it's going to estimate 100 rows. Because of that, before using AQP here, we end up usually having scenarios where you might be using the wrong operator to join tables. Remember, we've already talked about nested loops and how that's basically a for each loop. So for every row coming through here, which is 231,000, we're going to go ahead and seek another table. Um, also, another thing you'll tend to see here is because we estimated low amount of rows, we're going to have a low amount of memory that we can end up using for 10 dB. So this is a perfect example where our bad statistic there for a multi-statement function ends up not giving us enough memory, so we actually have to dump to 10 dB. Also, you'll notice over here, 
that we have an extremely low memory gram of basically one MB here. So this is exactly what you would see if you're using a multi-statement table value function before 2017. And we're gonna talk about how this will change here in a bit. All right, so next we're gonna go ahead and look at our inline table value function. All right, and we're gonna see this is quite a bit different. So with an inline table value function, when we go look at our rows here, we're gonna see actual good statistics here. We're also gonna see that we use a better operator based on the data we have. We're no longer using our for each loop, AKA our nested loop. Also, you don't see anywhere here where we're spooling to 10 DBE. And if we go look at our memory usage here, you're gonna see that we basically went 23 times of what we were using before here. So this is what you would see before we get into AQP. So if you're working and you're not on 2017 or 19, and you're used to a multi-statement table value function that you can rewrite as an inline one, that would be a good way for you to look like a superstar and get great performance. Now, if you're able to go ahead and move to the newer versions of SQL, you'll see that some of this actually happens for you. And that's where we're gonna go next. So we're gonna to go to 2019, because it makes everything faster, by switching our compatibility mode. We're gonna go over here and dump our plans. And now we're gonna rerun those two queries again. So we're gonna look at the multi-statement table value function. And we're gonna see this is very different. Remember before we had 100 rows, we had the nested loop, we were spooling to 10 dB, we had small amount of memory. Well, basically what happened is as the plan was being executed, it paused and said, hey, wait a minute, we can actually get statistics over here. So here we can see before we only had 100, now we actually have some accurate statistics over here. Sorry, that's the where we wanted to go, the 231,000 rows. Because of this, we have a proper join. Just like an inline statement before AQP, you can see that we're using more memory and this plan looks pretty similar. I mean, you can see that the memory here is actually quite a bit less, but this does a pretty good job of shifting it for you. So lastly here, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at doing an inline function, inline table value function here. And so this just shows you that even though you can use the new features to go ahead and help you get a better plan, here's a great example of us still rewriting it as an inline statement and getting even a better value because we're actually using a new different type of adaptive join, which we're going to go ahead and highlight over here due to time in this demo. So normally I'd have a whole separate demo for this, but the main thing that you want to know about adaptive query join is we have three operators that you can use to join tables. And we've seen two of them so far. There's the nested loop, AKA the for loop, and then there is the hash match, right? These two can be used as a combo join, which we will see here. And the first thing that should show you that this is quite a bit different is, let's look at our hash match up here. Like any other table join, you see two things coming in, one coming out. With this adaptive join here, we have an extra one. And that's because there's kind of a hybrid process here. When I say hybrid process, you're actually gonna have an adaptive threshold rows. And what this basically means, and this goes off of statistics, is the amount of rows that go through, if it's higher than that, and you're in batch mode, meaning you have columns stored here on 2017, this will actually go through and do your hash match for you. Now, if the amount of rows is lower than that, 
then it will use the nested loop. So you don't actually have to go and change anything. And this is why we're going to see here that with here with the hash, we use the scan because that's more efficient. Now, if we ran this with different parameters, we would actually go down to the lower one over here. Right? And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and go over and show you exactly how that looks real quick. So let me go over here to, all right, so here we go. Here's an example here. We're using the wide world data warehouse here. Let's go ahead and run this. All right, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and take a look at our selectivity here. So this, again, this is just showing you the same thing we've been beating down throughout today's session is in a lot of databases, you're going to have different data skew, meaning different amount of rows per what you're trying to filter. And when you build an execution plan, it's going to use the parameters at runtime to build that plan, and that plan will be reused as much as it possibly can. Normally that's good, but when you have big data skew like this, you can have scenarios where things go a little wonky. So we're gonna go back over here. I'm gonna go ahead and dump everything here. And we're gonna show you exactly how this would work before using AQP here. So when I look at my execution plan here, we have our hash match, right? Because we're working with enough data where that's a much better operator here. But if I went and ran this one here, we would end up seeing a different execution plan. All right, we see our nested loop, just as expected, just like before. All right, next we're gonna go ahead and we're actually gonna use 2019 CTP 2.4 here to go over how this would look for you. So once we scroll down here, we're gonna go ahead and run. So we're changing our compatibility mode here going over to 17. And now we are gonna run the exact same two cases here. And we'll see how they're different in this case. So when we go look at our execution plans here, we're gonna see both ends of our spectrum here. So here's a case where we're actually looking at customers, which every row is unique here. So if we're in a scenario in this example, where we're looking at one customer, then we're gonna go ahead and do our nested loop join. Where over here in our second query, we're looking at multiple here. And you can see here that we're actually going to our hash match because the amount of rows is greater than the amount by our adaptive threshold rows. All right, so with that, we are gonna go ahead and go ahead and go on down to our next demo here. So I'm gonna go over here. Pull up our scalar function. And here, scalar demo. All right. So once again here, we're gonna go ahead and turn on Query Store. We're gonna go back over to our Adventure Works database here. Right. I'm gonna make sure my good friend over here that I'm using for our demo, Mr. Profiler, is running. Because we're gonna see why scalar functions are what I refer to as a silent performance killer. Because when we actually run them, we're not going to see them in the way that we would expect. And I'll explain that here in a demo. 
right? So we're going to we're going to go ahead and clear out our execution plans and data pages here to have a cold starting point. I'm going to go ahead here and switch our compatibility mode to before 2019-78. So I have this in here because I know that my query stopped, so I need to modify my trace here because I'm only going after the single session that we are interested in here. So we're going to go ahead and change this here on the event selection. And we're going to go ahead and go column filters. And we should see that our session ID. So we're only going after our guy here. I'm going to go ahead and make this 78, if it'll let me. Hit OK. Go ahead and rerun here. All right, so now we have our session. We know it's session 78. So I'm going to go ahead now, and we're going to create our functions here. All right, so here, if they exist, we're going to go ahead and remove them. And then here, I'm showing a scalar function here that is hitting a sales order detailed and large table. And the reason why I say this is a silent performance killer is because when we use this function and we actually look at the execution plan or set statistics, we're not going to see it there like we normally would. So I'm going to go ahead and run this here. And this is going to create our scalar function. All right. Now we're going to have our starting point here. Basically, I want to throw everything out that's in memory in the trash can so we can have a fair apples to apples comparison when we run the scalar function here versus a table value function. So here we're going to go ahead. And what this is doing here is for every single row in my products table, it's going to run that function we just created that hits that a large table and passes in a product ID. And this is going to happen row by row, every single row that needs to go into it. And you can see this took around 22 seconds. And I wish I had an execution plan here because we don't and due to time. I'm just going to get us an estimated one. That'll work. And there we can see this is what you would end up seeing, and you just have your scan here. Because we did an estimated one here, it's actually going to get you your function. But if you looked at the actual, you would only see the one. Now, if we actually go now back over here, this is driving home that we can see for every single row, we're running that statement inside of that function. So this is what we call row after agonizing row, because this is happening every single row and the more data you have the more problems and the more of a performance bottleneck this becomes for you all right so with that we're going to go ahead and show you how could you fix this if you weren't on 2017 or i'm sorry 2017 or actually 2019 this is a new feature in 2019. you could do this by going ahead and creating what's known as a table value function. But here, we're actually just going to go straight to 2019. We saw this took over 20 seconds to run originally. And in this case here, we're going to see the time is about the same. We get our same starting point here. We're going to run the exact same query here. And what we're going to notice first off here is we are not going to have this row by row processing that we were seeing before. So we actually go through here. We're going to end up seeing one single execution because behind the scenes, SQL Server 2019 is realizing that this is a scalar function that can be eligible 
to be converted over to set base logic here for what we want. So once this finishes here, which I believe it probably just did, we are going to actually go through here. And now you see the whole full plan out there. And also when we go to message statistics here, we can see that we actually have our enlarged table there as well. So while there's more that you could do to tune this and make this run a lot more efficient, this is showing you exactly what this would look like for you without you having to change your code and it getting being able to stop doing row by row processing there. So last thing we're going to do here in the demo is just show you what, what this would look like if you weren't on 2019 and you wanted to make this better. And we already kind of talked about it. It's basically rewrite it so it's a table value function here. So we're going to do that. So we're, we're going to work with a set of data here. So we're going to create our function here. And then we're going to cross apply over here. So basically, we're going to do this as set base logic because we have a table value function that we can pass in a set of data here. And so once this runs, we're going to see we went from over 20 to 6 here. And once again, we have an execution plan that shows you everything there in our statistics for everything. So if you're not on 2019, which most people aren't yet because it's not even released yet as a full-blown release, this is something that you can easily do to identify and change to make your code run faster. But once 2019 is out and you're using it, you will see that it can detect it for you and help make the performance a little bit better. And so with that, Carlos, I know we had to go super quick. I'm going to try to get to our last slide here. Do you have any quick question or two that we can throw out there? I, I've been answering as many questions as I, I, I could along the way, so I, I think I only have one or two for you. Okay, and, uh, well, the, I want to get this up in case. Yeah, I think that was one of the questions, actually, is uh, people used that link, but they they went to that website but couldn't find the links uh, that they need to uh, download. Are the links on that page? Okay, I would tell everyone to try, let me, I'll click on it right now and we'll see. That should work. Um, I'll go through and double check and make sure everything out there is working. And I think other questions. So this is the main one. This will it'll link to everything that we have out there. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I, after this meeting here, I will go through and double check those other links, Carlos, and then I'll make sure you get an updated copy of the PowerPoint. But yes, this this is the main link that should get you to almost everything there. Okay, and um, I thought you kind of answered this as you went, but um, um, I mean, everything you said applied to 2019 and not earlier, right? Um, and I guess somebody had a question about automatic tuning on 2017, and you're not really covering that subject. I assume, I assume what you showed wouldn't work on 2017. <laughs> So automatic tuning for plan changes was added in 17. That was, I think, the demo that didn't work as designed. Um, so yes, yeah, that should work for 17. There's some other stuff added in 19. Okay. Okay. Well, and I'm not clear about what the question there really was. So, um, okay. but there was something about that. Um, do you, how about performance issues from Query Store? Do you ever see uh, anything like that affecting CPU performance or that sort of thing? So, yes, I have. That's a great question. So, whenever you're working with any type of tool, you want to test it with your workload. And we didn't get to dive deep into it, but there's a lot of different knobs that you can use to tweak its impact that it'll have for you. Um, so yeah, I'll make sure to get a blog post out that has a lot more guidance there. But yes, there's a couple of things that definitely there's some trace flags that can be very important to you, especially with bigger sets of data, because it can actually slow down your recovery process. 
um, which you would probably never want your recovery process to be slowed down by a monitoring aspect of your database, which is why they have those trace flags. Um, but I'll get a blog post that goes into that in a lot more detail. Okay, that Throw sounds that good. Here on the resource. Um, I mean, that's all I have at this point. Uh, I think that was everything. I think you covered everything really well, so and kind of answered people's questions along the way as well. Okay, great. Okay. Well, I know we ran really quick, so here's a bunch of ways for anyone to contact me. If you have questions or there's more things you would like to know, feel free to, to reach out to me, and I'll try to point you in the best direction I can. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John. Always great to have you on. Really appreciate it. We'll definitely have to have you back and give you more time. All right. Thank you, Carlos. Okay. Thanks a lot. Goodbye, everyone.